So, since it is the Believer's Convention, I think it might be appropriate for me to share a few things about <laughs> faith. <laughs> so, turn in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 1, if you would. And I would like to just share some things with you. In fact, let me read this scripture first, and then uh, I'll comment on our title, our subject, and then we'll be off and running. 2 Peter chapter 1. If you have it, say, I have it. I have it. All right, let's look at verse 12 and 13. Peter is speaking. He says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you. Say, remind you. Remind. To remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent or body to stir you up by what? Reminding you. So I think that my assignment tonight will be along the lines of reminding you. But I also know and am persuaded that there will be some that it will not be a reminder, but rather it will be a revelation. But I believe that you'll be blessed. What I want to talk about and share with you is from the subject of um, how important is faith? You know, we hear a lot about it and people use the word and throw it around, but how important is it? So that's what we want to pursue tonight. Now, I uh, always like to be very clear in dealing with people so that we're on the same page, meaning that, that, that I'm talking about one thing and you're hearing what I'm talking about and you're not thinking about something else. Uh, some years ago in the ghetto communities of our nation, uh, around the, in the 70s, the young men, the young black men, came up with a descriptive term to describe an attractive female. And they came up with this term, fox, F-O-X. And so they say, whoo, man, you should have been with, brother, you should have been with the day I saw a fox. At the same time, a brand new automobile manufacturing company came online called Audi. And their first entry into the automobile marketplace was a small, compact car called the Audi Fox. Ever since time immemorial, there's been a pointed nose, pointed ear, short-legged, bushy-tailed animal called a fox. So I come in here and say, ooh, you guys should have been with, y'all should have been with me today. I saw a fox. So what comes to your mind? Attractive woman, automobile, or an animal? See, I could be talking auto, you're talking female, somebody else is talking car, so we didn't, we didn't communicate. So I want to be sure that you understand what I mean when I say F-A-I-T-H, faith. Socrates, the father of philosophy, said that in order for two intelligent people to converse with one another, they had to first of all define their terms. So the first thing I want to do is to define what I mean when I say faith. Now, you might not agree with it. That's all right. But don't trash it until you've heard the whole story. And then on your way out, you can throw it in the trash bin. But don't assume that you know everything. You don't. None of us do. I'm glad I know I don't know all, everything, but I thank God for what I do know. But I plan to go on from glory to glory to glory in terms of knowledge. So, I want to be sure you understand what I mean by faith. So turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. What's so important about faith? Well, if you didn't know, you're going to know after tonight. All right. 2 Timothy chapter what? All right, we're going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture. Paul said this as he neared the end of his ministry and life. Verse 7, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the what? Faith. Faith. Kept the what? Faith. F-A-I-T-H. I have kept the what? Faith. Faith. Now, some years back, I haven't heard this term used very much in America in recent years, but there was a term that was very uh, common at one point in our history in reference to people wanting to locate another person in reference to their religious or spiritual connection. So they would say, what faith are you, Protestant, Catholic, or Jew? I don't know if any of you ever remember hearing that. And, of course, we hear a lot today about faith-based based situations in reference to the federal government and so-called religious organizations. So that's one way that the word faith can be used. 
When I say F-A-I-T-H, I don't mean that. I don't mean Protestant, Catholic, or Jew. And I don't mean I have kept the faith like Paul said. Because Paul was using the word here as a synonym for Christianity as a whole. He said, I've kept Christianity intact. I haven't violated it in any way. I've kept it pure. I've kept the faith. I don't mean that when I say F-A-I-T-A. Let me show you what I mean. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Because if we're not on the same page, meaning if we're not hearing and agreeing on the same thing, at least in terms of our discussion, then you could miss what the Spirit of God would say through me tonight for your edification. All right. Romans chapter what? Three. Three. If you have it, say I have it. Verse 27. Paul says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. So Paul is saying that the faith he's talking about here is a law, a spiritual law, not what faith are you, Protestant, Catholic, or Jew. He's talking about a law. Now, that word law also translates from the original language as principle. That's another word that could be used, principle. Now, principle is said in concrete. Principles never change. Our attitude towards a principle may change over time, but principles remain the same. Up will always be up, down will always be down, cold will always be cold, hot will always be hot, true will always be true, and false will always be false. Those are principles, they never change. So Paul is saying that faith, the faith he's talking about, is a spiritual law or principle. And I suggest to you that this law or principle operates in the kingdom of God. It is once a person becomes a Christian, once they have done what Romans 10, 9 says, if you will confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. We call it salvation, regeneration, being born again, born anew, or literally born from above. You are now called a Christian. Once you become a Christian, say, once I become a Christian. Once I become a Christian, once you become a Christian, then the most important thing for you to learn is the law or principle of faith. There is nothing else in the kingdom of God more important than F-A-I-T-H. Nothing is more important. You can't think of anything this more important. You can't find anything in the Word of God that indicates it's more important than faith. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yes, Brother Price, but what about 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Doesn't it say, now abides faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Oh, it have to do, absolutely says that, but, 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 where do we find 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Where, where is it found? In the Bible. But where in the Bible? Where, where is it found in the Bible? I tell you. It is found just after 1 Corinthians chapter 12. No, don't laugh. Don't laugh, you're going to learn something now. Don't, don't laugh, I'm not being funny. You find it right after 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and just before 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now the question arises, what is chapter 12 and 14 about? They're about the charismata. They're about the gifts of the Spirit. They're about the operation of the supernatural in the kingdom of God. Now in the church at Corinth, they had all of the manifestations of the Spirit of God in operation, but they had no order. Read the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, and it talks about the fact you come behind and no gifts, but everything was out of order. So Paul wrote the letter to correct so there would be some order, decency, and order in the operation of the gifts. Now, right between the two chapters that deal with the gifts and their operation, he sandwiches in chapter 13. He says, now by his faith, hope, love these three, but the greatest of these is love. Well, what is he talking about? Is he talking about the greatest thing in the world? Absolutely not. Love is not the greatest thing in the world. 
Uh oh, what did I say that for? Mm -hmm. Ooh, that group over there got real hostile when I said that. I'm gonna move over here. No, love is not the greatest thing in the world. If love is the greatest thing in the world, now hear the whole thing. Don't put up a roadblock. Listen to it. You might learn something. Love is not the greatest thing in the world. If you think it is, then wherever you live, I don't know how you do your thing, but I'm sure you probably have to have some food to eat on a weekly basis. Here in America, we would say go to the supermarket and pick out your groceries and meat and whatever it might be and put it in a market basket with wheels on it, wheel it up to the checkout counter and uh, the checker checks it all out and runs it through the little automatic thing and it says $112.15. So when the cashier reaches a hand out or his hand out for some money, say, no! <laughs> and see if they let you out of the store with the groceries. So there's a case where love wasn't the greatest thing, it was money that was the greatest thing. Go get you out of that store with those groceries. I'm sure many of us have had the experience where we've stood or sat beside the bedside of someone we love very much and we watched a horrible disease just deteriorate them and take their life away. No one could have been loved more than we loved them, but our love didn't keep them alive. They died in spite of our love. But somebody walked, we've seen some cases where someone has walked in a room with the faith of God and the power of God and that sick person that was declared to die and not live rose up off of that sick bed because the power of God through faith brought it to pass so then what's Paul talking about well Paul is talking about motive because he starts out by saying though I speak with the tongue of men and an angel and don't and if I don't have charity or love I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal he goes through this whole thing he gets down to the end of the chapter and he says now nah, by his faith hope love these three but the greatest of these is love what's he talking about he's talking about the greatest motivator and the greatest motivator in the world is love because it was because God so loved the world that he gave it motivated him to give because he loved so in 1st Corinthians chapter 13 it's not talking about the greatest thing in the world is talking about the greatest thing that motivates so love is the greatest motivator but faith is the greatest activator yes, yes but brother price doesn't Galatians tell us that faith works by love yes it absolutely does but I'll tell you something else that the Bible doesn't say but the principle is there anyway and that is that love works by faith and until you learn how to love by faith, you're going to always have problem with crazy people and their crazy attitudes and actions. And that's why so many of you have problems with people in churches is because everybody is not lovable. In fact, you want to take them out. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise the Lord. They are not lovable at all. But I tell you what, if you learn how to love by faith, it doesn't matter how ugly they get because their ugly doesn't change your love. See what I mean? So, so love is the motive. I, I preach the word. I teach the word. I do what I do. I take care of my family because of love. I serve God because of love. I live right because of love. I tithe because of love. I do the right thing because of love. That's the reason I do it because it motivates me. So it's the greatest motivator. There's nothing in the world that motivates you greater than love. But faith is the greatest activator. And everything in the kingdom of God is activated by faith. So if you don't understand it and how it works, then you're going to be a victim. Now, we live in a very awesome age today, uh, electronically especially. I mean, we've got so many gizmos and gadgets that it's unreal, and they're coming out every minute with something new. I mean, computers, regular computers, PCs, and then laptop computers, and then handheld computers, MP3 players, uh, iPod players. All kinds of electronic things, cell phones. They even got cell phones now. Phones used to be to communicate. Now you can look at movies on them with the phone, take pictures, click, smile big, you know. And, and we've got all kinds of electronic gadgets and gizmos. And we have these TV lights here. We have the television cameras here that are actually taking pictures. Some of you have digital cameras and all these electronic things. And yet every single one of them works by one thing only electricity and when the electricity goes down and there's a power outage everything crashes your computers won't work your TV won't work your lights go out the air conditioning goes out everything everything electronically is activated by electricity 
either by direct current, batteries, or alternating current. But it's the alternating current or the generator type current that produces the DC current for your batteries. You've got to recharge them because they're going to run down. Your cell phone's going dead. It's going to die on you. But unless you plug it in and recharge it. Electricity. When electricity goes down over the city, all the lights go, everything stops. So how important is electricity to us in these days? In fact, you can't drive your car without electricity. You can't drive a car unless you have electricity because it's electricity that pro provides the spark that ignites the gasoline that causes combustion in your engine that drives the drivetrain that turns the wheels through the gear shift in your car goes. So if the battery goes dead, how? You ever had that experience when the battery was dead, died? Car wouldn't run, would it? I said it wouldn't run, would it? Because of what? Electricity. So I'm using that as an analogy. In the kingdom of God, everything operates by faith. And that's why faith, Satan fights us so much. Some people, Christians, and I trust there's none of them that are here tonight like that, but some people, they, 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 they got the wrong slant on it. They listen to the lie of the devil. The devil said, oh, the faith movement. I hate that term because it's not, it's not really, actually what it was, it, it was a term that was coined by the detractors of those of us that have had the assignment to teach on these subjects of faith and power and prosperity, etc. And so that to, to shoot at us, they call us the, that faith bunch. And it's so dumb, even this term, word of faith. I hate that term, word of faith. Oh, that's the word of faith, people. And they don't understand that every single Christian is a word of faith person. They might not know it, but they're a word of faith people. Now, let me, let me explain that. Now, don't take offense at this, and I don't mean this as a put-down, but just as a point of reference so you can understand where I'm coming from. I, I, was, I, I was called to the ministry. The Lord spoke to me in what to me was an audible voice, just like Paul on the road to Damascus. The only difference was I didn't see any light, but I heard a voice. It had direction to it. I looked over my shoulder to see who was talking to me. It wasn't anybody in that part of the building. So I know that, 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 that I was called because God spoke to me. Are you following me? Now, I was in a Baptist church. No offense now. Just letting you know geographically where I was in a Baptist church. And what people don't know is that the Baptist church is a word of faith church. Now, you got to li listen to the whole thing. The Methodist church is a word of faith church. The Catholic church is a word of faith church. The Lutheran church is a word of faith church. The AME, CME, and uh, what's the other EME? Oh, EME, just Methodist Episcopal. All of them are word of faith churches. Now, here's what I mean. Maybe not like you think of word of faith, like charismatic word of faith, uh, prosperity, uh, wealth, and healing, and all that. But they're word of faith. Here's why. Because in the average Baptist church, they get more folks saved than any charismatic church does. You know why? Because all they preach primarily are salvation messages. And so faith comes by hearing, so people hear the message of salvation and they get healed or get saved. And so that's word of faith. They preach the word of faith. Right. You didn't know that, see? You thought you knew everything. But think about it. Because I think, Ken, you read it, didn't you, in, in Romans? What do we preach? The word of faith. Paul said that 2,000 years ago. That's not a charismatic terminology as such. That is... God's word. Whenever God's word is proclaimed, it causes faith to come for whatever subject is being broached at the time. So it's word of faith because that word, whatever it might be, watch this. Even if it's a word of unbelief, it's going to cause faith to come. Negative faith, but still faith. That's why you got to watch what you hear because what you hear is going to affect your faith positively or negatively. You got to be careful what you hear because that's the way God designed the system. Faith comes by hearing. Now, for the believers, it comes by hearing the word of God. But you can hear the opposite and still get faith for it. Excuse me. You still get faith for it. So, people say, well, the faith movement is over. It was a wave, and now the wave has crested and broken on the shore, and God's doing a new thing. Well, faith was a season, Brother Price, and now the season is over. God is doing a new thing. I'm going to show you from the Bible that faith was never a season. It was never a movement. And it was never a wave. It was always what it has always and always been and always will be. 
because it can't change because if it changes then God has to change so you need to bone up and find out how to live by faith Amen. so we're going to talk about how important it is Amen. not a wave never was hadn't gone any place still here now turning your Bibles to Romans chapter 1 let's see first of all how important it is how, why should we why should we talk about it why should we study well but like I said everything in the kingdom of God is activated by faith healing is activated by faith giving is activated by faith I mean how do you give your money that you don't make enough of in the first place how do you give it to a God you have never seen and have the audacity to believe that you're going to receive something in return from a God you have never seen but you give your offering you got to do that by faith, even if you don't realize you're doing it. Now, what happens when you find out what you're doing and why you're doing it? Ah, boy, that just, makes, that just adds the jet fuel to it and makes it take off big time. Amen. But everything in the kingdom of God is activated by faith, everything. Amen. So I need to learn how it operates so I can successfully maneuver through the kingdom of God. All right, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. If you have it, say I have it. We want to find out what's so important about faith. All right. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. It says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live how? By faith. Okay. The just shall what? Live by faith. Now, the word just, in case you think you're not just, J-U-S-T, J-U-S-T, anything you see in the New Testament where it says justified, just, or justification, it literally means and simply means declared righteous. That's what it means, declared righteous. So we could read it like this. For in it the righteousness of God, because it's talking about righteousness. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, those who have been declared righteous shall live by faith. So I have a question for you. I have a question. Now, I don't know many of you so don't don't be offended I, I have to point to you because I know your name but I want to use I want it to be visual I want it to be real okay so you really understand I want to ask you a question so do you mind if I ask you a question all right in a in a 24 hour period how many hours do you live hush 24 Tw all 24 I live. wow okay that's cool all right in a in a in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, hey, you thought she was going to get by on that. I'm like, I got you, girl. I got you. In a seven-day week, how many of the seven days do you live? All seven. All seven. Awesome. All right. In a 365-day year, how many of those days do you live? 365. So we have 24-7, 365. Now watch this. If the just or those who have been declared righteous shall live by faith, then that means that you're supposed to live by faith 24-7, 365. So if faith has gone out and faith was a movement and faith was a wave and God's doing a new thing, then what's going to take its place for the just to live by? And didn't God know in eternity past that he was going to change the rules of engagement? Didn't he know that he was going to do away with faith and he was going to substitute something else? Then why did he put it in hard copy that cannot be deleted? So don't listen to some fool that tells you faith is gone and God's doing a new thing. Why would he do a new thing when you haven't mastered the old thing? what I don't know, they, they, they have different things nowadays but I, when I went to school here in Los Angeles I was born and raised here when I went to school in grammar school there was kids that didn't pass and make a passing grade you stayed your skinny or big size posterior portion of your anatomy you stayed right in that seat and we had kids that went two or three times in the same grade because they didn't make a passing grade. Now they just pass you through. But then you stayed until you made a passing grade. Why would God, who has a little more sense than we do, change the rules of engagement, change the way things work, and make us do something else when we didn't master this? Because if we had mastered this, we wouldn't have so many poor Christians, sick Christians, scared Christians, racist Christians 
depressed Christians, stressed out Christians. Why would God change it? We haven't mastered that. No, it's still in. The just shall live by faith. So that means 24-7, 365. It's not a spare tire that you use when you have a problem. It's not a parachute to bail you out of some present dilemma. It's not an Aladdin lamp that you rub and say, Genie, genie, I want a yacht. Genie, genie, I want a, a house on the hill. No, it's a way of life. The God kind of life. In fact, it's the, uh, the lifestyle of the rich and faithful in Christ. So that's one thing. There's one witness. That's one, the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three. Let me give you another one. Let me give you another one. Uh, turn now to Hebrew chapter 11. If faith is gone and God's doing a new thing, I'll, somebody tell me what the new thing is. Christians are so gullible. They just swallow the, <laughs> they swallow anything. Well, sound good. Yeah, God doing a new thing. So what's the new thing? Did God ever tell you what the new thing was? If it's not faith, then what is it? Stupid. <laughs> El Stupido, better known as El Dumbo. <laughs> I didn't call anybody's name. I just said, okay, watch this now. Hebrews chapter 11. All right, you have it? Say, I have it. Verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible. Stop. Stop right there. Stop right there. Look up, look up, look up, look up. Listen to it. You look up. I'm going to read it again. But without faith, it is impossible. Now, it doesn't matter what comes after the word impossible. Whatever it is, without faith, it's impossible. Listen, look at it again. But without faith, it is impossible. It doesn't matter what comes after that word impossible. Whatever it is, without faith, it won't work. It won't compute. So if God takes faith out, then how are you going to do it? All right, let's find out what's impossible. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Most people stop reading right there. Yes, Brother Price, the word of God says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And I believe that God is. I believe that God is. Brother, sister, the verse doesn't stop there. Let, let, let's go on. It says, must believe that he is and. Must believe that he is and what? That he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Not those who diligently seek things, but seek him. Pick up on that. Check that out. Now, now watch this now. Without faith, it's impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is. Now, you don't have to come to God. He won't make you. You don't have to come to God. You can go to hell. You can, and God will protect your right to go to hell. He won't let anybody interfere with you. He'll mark martial angels around you. They will escort you right to the gate of hell. They'll see to it that the gate opens up, that you go in, and nobody interferes with you. If that's your choice. I'm not trying to be funny. It's true. God's not going to make you do anything. Because if he's going to make anybody do anything, he'll make some of you penny pinching Christians tithe. So, you know, but we're not going to go there, are we? We're not going there, are we? No, we're not going to go there. No, no. No, God's not going to make you do anything. So, so he said, but, he, but without faith it's impossible to please him for he who comes to God. So you don't have to come to God. But, say but, if you make the choice to come to God at that point, if you want to please him, you have no other choices, no other options. It must be by faith. So if faith goes out, how are you going to please God? What's the new thing God's bringing in for you to be able to please him with? Why did it get so quiet? Talk to me, all you folks talking about God doing a new thing. So what's the new thing? I need to know. Inquiring minds want to know and I have a very inquiring mind tell me you can't that's why that's why you're silent that's not a put down just an observation he said but without faith it's impossible to please him you know if you can't please the man you're sure not going to trick him into answering your prayer or providing your need if you don't please him so faith is in it's a spiritual law or principle and you might as well learn quickly how it operates because the just are supposed to live 
by faith. And you live 24-7, 365. So how important is faith? Seems to me like it's pretty, imp pretty important here. How important is it? Seems like it's pretty important. Now, let's look at what it is. What, what, what you know, what, 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 what it is. What, 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 what is it? Now, here's where you got to be very careful. F-A-I-T-H, Bible F-A-I-T-H. What, what, what does it mean? Well, here, here's the tricky thing. Most of you that are real serious Bible students that really study the Bible, you probably have a Strong's Concordance or a Young's Concordance or Cruden's Concordance and even perhaps a uh, W. E. Vines Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament words. So when you want to look up a word uh, in the Bible, you go to the concordance, right? And then in the back of Strong's, it's, there's a dictionary, two dictionaries. One is Hebrew and one is Greek. And they're supposed to tell you the meaning of the Greek words. And so we rely on those. If you're a serious, serious student, you rely on those. And so whatever the dictionary says, you believe. And... What people don't know is that dictionaries were never designed to tell you what words mean. Dictionaries don't tell you what a word means. I tell you what a word means. <laughs> now watch, and you tell me what a word means, and when you and I agree, it gets put in the dictionary. Now, if you don't believe that, go to your local library, go to the reference department, and you should probably find a reference table. And on that table, a huge, real, big, fat, thick dictionary called an underbridge dictionary. You could go to that dictionary and find certain words. You'll find the word in there 15 times, pronounced the same way, spelled the same way, and 15 different meanings. Because the dictionary was designed to tell you historically how that word has been used in the English-speaking world. It does not tell you what the word means. We, we come to an agreement. I tell you, you tell me, when we agree, it gets in the dictionary. Now, I use that illustration over here in the Greek dictionary because we, we end up with a problem. And the reason a lot of Christians are confused about faith is because if you look up the word F-A-I-T-H in Strong's, Young's, or W.E. Vines, and if you look up the word believe, they mean the same thing. In other words, they'll say that faith means belief and that belief means faith. So some people, they think that because they believe that they're in faith. And that's why things haven't worked. Because they thought they were in faith when they were in fact only in belief. And see, belief won't change your circumstances. Belief won't change anything. All belief does is set the stage. If you don't bring faith to play on it, then what you believe will never come to pass. Now, let me give you a simple, practical illustration. You'll be able to see this. Probably most of you that are adults and, 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 and have a driver's license, perhaps in whatever state you live in or country, uh, but, but, but let's just use, we'll use California, Los Angeles, since you're here, okay? And <clears throat> let us say that well, does, any, does anybody live here in California that's here tonight and you have a car? You, you came here in a car. Anybody? Oh, you drove a car here? Oh, do you have the keys in your pocket? Oh, no, 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 that's why you're not bringing them. All right, watch this now. Okay, so where is your car parked in the parking lot? All right, so tonight when the service is over, your plan, I would believe, would be to go get in your car with your key and drive home. Right? Am I right? Okay, so here's what I want you to do. When, when the service is over and everybody's dispersing, I want you to pull your keys out, walk out to the parking lot, find your car, climb up on top of the hood of the car, and hold, hold the keys up high so everybody can see it, and shout out as loud as you can, I believe that if I take this key and get in my car and insert the key in the ignition and start the car, I can drive home. And that is absolutely, positively, historically, and scientifically true. 
But if you don't ever get off the hood and get in the car and drive home, you'll be standing on that hood until hell freezes over. Because believing will not change your circumstances. But acting on what you believe, which is what faith is, getting in the car, starting it up, and driving it home, that's what's going to get you home. Big difference. So you can't even believe that so you got to watch this because you, when you read the scriptures, we have a tendency just to simply take everything one verse at a time and use it. And, and what the verse says is true, but it also has to be buttressed up by all the rest of what the Bible says about that same subject. For instance, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but ever, ever, everlasting life. Well, that's not going to get you saved. Ooh. Oh, what? What did I come to? I didn't know this. I heard this was a cult, but my goodness, that's some, that's some false doctrine there. Oh, no, it's not. No, 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 no. That's just because you don't know the Bible. Let me show you something. It's going to blow your little gaskets. No, seriously, watch this now. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Oh. You still here? Okay. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, chapter 2, chapter 2, chapter 2, chapter 2, chapter 2. You have, if you have to say, I have it. All right, verse 19. You believe there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Question, are they saved? Why not? They believe. The Bible said they believe. Why aren't they saved? Ah. Uh, because they don't do what John 1, 12 said. Not only believe, but to as many as received him, to them gave he the power, the right or privilege, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Yeah, believing is where you start, but if you don't receive, yes, your believing is going to leave you like a demon. Unsaved and on your way to the pit. <laughs> right? See, so it, it, all, it's all, it all goes together. It starts out with that, and we need to realize that, but you have to understand all that the Scripture says about that. Just believing won't get you saved. You got to receive. You have to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. But you start out believing, and that's what gets you to the receiving part, but just all, if all you do is just believe, they're not going to get you saved. And so you can believe, just like I use that illustration, and, and everything that I said about that young man in the car, it's just true. You could not find anywhere in, 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 in our nation or society where that, that would not be a true statement. But that's not going to get you home just believing if you put the key in and, and start the car up that you could drive home. That's true, but that won't get you home. You have to do it. And that's where a lot of Christians have missed it, sincerely missed it, not realizing it and wondering why things didn't occur. Then they believe the devil's lie. God didn't want you to have that. Don't you know God knew if you got that, you'd probably stop going to church. So God knew it would be better for you to ride public transportation than to have your own car. And we swallowed that thing, hook, line, and sinker, the fishing pole, the reel, the fisherman, and his boots. We swallowed the whole lot. <laughs> swallowed the whole thing. And we're sincere. See what I mean? We're not talking about anybody not being sincere. But if you don't know the whole scoop on it, you can be sincere, but be sincerely wrong. Yes, yes, yes. And get no results. And think it's because God didn't want you to have it. Because you knew your own sincerity and you knew this had, it should work because I know what I believe and so it must not be God's will. So faith is acting on what you believe. And we're talking about Bible faith, but even natural, natural human faith that everybody has because only those that have been born of the Spirit of God have the God kind of faith. Everybody else has natural human faith. And even in the natural realm, it works the same way. If you don't act on what you believe, it won't do you any good. You can sit down at a table filled up with food and die of starvation right there at the table. If what? You don't eat. And eating is the action part. Yeah, you believe that if you eat the food, it surely will keep you from starving to death. And that's true historically, scientifically. It's true, but if you don't eat, <laughs> you're going to die of starvation. So you've got to act on what you believe. You say you believe the word. Oh, yes, Brother Price. Hallelujah. I believe the word of God. From Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> I believe all of it. You, you believe the Bible. Oh, yes, hallelujah. I believe it's the word of God. I have no, no doubt about it. 
You mean you, you believe that what God says is true? Oh, yes, brother. I'm trying to tell you, brother. I believe everything that God said. You do? Yes. Are you a tither? Uh, no. <laughs> I thought I heard God say bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Hmm. But you said you believe the Bible. Oh, yes, but you don't act on it. So you don't, you don't do it. And that's why you don't get results. See, because the way God has designed the system to work, it's, it's activated by faith. Here in Los Angeles, we have uh, in different sections of the county, they have different utility companies. Uh, out where I live, we have Southern California Edison Company that provides the electrical energy to the homes. Amen. When I used to live in L.A. City, it was the Department of Water and Power. And, and when, I, when we bought the house, uh, the house was empty, nobody lived in it. We had to contact the, the, the Edison company and sign up so that we could have them to furnish electricity to our home. And uh, so we signed up and we got hooked up to the electrical grid. And uh, I came home one day and uh, one night from work and the house was dark. And, and this is just an illustration. And, and I came in and Betty was in there. She had a candle going. And, and I said, Betty, what, what, what's up with the candle? She said, well, it got dark. I, I had to see. I had to cook your dinner, so I had to see. I said, well, is something wrong with the lights? Oh, I don't know. I never turned them on. <laughs> so simple, but so profound. The power cup. Oh, get this now. The power company's responsibility is to pipe the electrical energy to my house. Once it reaches my house, it's my responsibility to flip the switches. If I don't, even though the electrical power is available, I'll be in the dark. And the power of God is available and people are still not healed because they don't know how to receive. All right, moving right along. You still here? All right, now, now, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. You getting anything out of this? I don't know about you, but I'm glad I came. I, I, I love this job. I love my job. Oh, my goodness, I love it. Because, see, every time I teach you, I get to teach me. Amen. And I definitely am my own best customer. <laughs> yes, indeed. Hebrews chapter 11, if you have it, say, I have it. I want to show you now one of the most important things that you'll ever learn about faith. Probably the most important thing. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Many people know that verse by memory, Christian, and they quote it. But quoting that verse won't change your circumstances. Now here's the most important thing you want to learn about faith. Now, actually the word now in that verse is really not the word that should be there. In other words, it's, this word now doesn't mean a time, like a tense, past, present, future, yesterday, tomorrow, now. I used to think it did. And, and, I, and, I, and so I taught it that way, and, and of course, somebody challenged me on it. And so I always want to be right. And I figure if anybody on the planet can be right, why can't it be me? So I decided to check it up, and I found out that the person was right, that, that I couldn't use it technically as a designation of time, like now faith is. You could say yesterday faith was, you could say tomorrow faith will be, but you could also say now faith is. So actually it's a word that ties together the 39th verse and the 10th chapter to, number, to the first verse of the 11th. So what I did, this is the way I found out how, it, how, I, how I could use it. I dropped the word now, capitalized the word faith and made faith the first word of the verse. So then it would read like this. Faith is. Faith is. Faith is. That's present tense. That's in OW now. Because you could say faith was past tense. You could say faith will be future tense. When you say faith is, that's now. So I'm back in business. So then, I, then, I, then I, 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 I shuffled it around like this. All right, faith is. So then I compounded and I said, faith is now. Probably wouldn't make a good grade in English, but 
We're not talking about English right now. Faith is now. Or we could say it like this. Now faith is. Any way you cut it, it's still chocolate cake. In other words, present tense. We've got to always remember, faith is always now. If it's not now, it's not faith. Well, I know the Lord is going to do. Well, you're out of faith. Because when you say, I know the Lord is going to do, you have just said the Lord has not already done. And his word said he has already done. You say he hasn't done it because he's going to do it. So you and the Lord or the word are not in agreement. You short circuit the system. God can't work on your behalf. You have to agree with God. So now faith is. It's always now. Present tense. If it's not present tense, it's, it's not faith. So that's the first and primary thing you got to learn about faith. It's always present tense. Never God's going to do something. If you make that, I know God is going to heal me. You better, you better sign the death certificate or get you, get you a good doctor because, man, you're on your way to the cemetery. You know, especially if you have a terminal illness because when you say God is going to do something, you're saying he hasn't already done it and he said he already did it and you said he didn't because you said he's got to do it, but he said he did it, but you say you're going, he's going to do it, so therefore you don't agree so the word can't work on your behalf because the word says, Matthew 8, 17, himself took our infirmity and bore our sickness took and bore our past tense turn meaning the work's already been done first peter 2 24 said and with his stripes ye were healed if ye were then ye are if ye are then ye is and now faith is okay there it is there it is all right second thing you have to learn it says now faith is the substance of things hoped for so can we get a, an agreement on the meaning of the word substance? Well, for the sake of time, let me tell you what I believe substance is. Tangibility, materiality, or better than that, substance is that which can be contacted with your senses. I can feel it, see it, smell it, taste it, or touch it. Can you agree with that? In other words, it, 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 it uh, impacts on my physical senses that are located in my physical body. Right? Substance. So watch this. Because many people quote the verse, but they don't see the significance of each stanza, if you would. It says, now faith is the substance. N not the substance is the substance. Faith is the substance. In this case, the substance of what? Things hope for. So that tells me that hope doesn't have any substance. Hope has no tangibility, no materiality, nothing you could ever contact with your senses unless you add your faith to your hope. If you add your faith to your hope, then you give hope substance, something that at some point in time your senses can contact. Hope is a goal setter, G-O-A-L. It sets the goal, but you have to have faith to go obtain the goal. Amen. What hope will do is it will affect your attitude about the circumstances, but it can never change the circumstances. What, what hope will do is let you smile while the ship is sinking. In other words, you go down with a good attitude. You know, instead of going down, ah, ah, we're going to die. Ah, I don't know what I'm going to do. You go down with a smile on your face, but you're still going down. But faith can keep the ship afloat. So hope sets the goal, but I have to have a methodology by which I can obtain the goal, and that methodology is faith. So, it says that faith is the substance, the materiality, the tangibility of things I hope for. Now, you've got to have hope, because hope is what sets the goal. You understand? You've got to have hope, miles and miles of hope. But you have to have a way to obtain the hope, and that's where faith comes in. Now, watch this. That's the second thing. It says, now faith is the substance, tangibility, or materiality of things hoped for. The evidence. Faith is the evidence of things, T-H-I-N-G-S. Not spirituals. Things. Say things. things. I didn't hear you. Things. I said I didn't hear you. Things. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. All right. What is another word for evidence? That's the best word I know. You're right. Proof. But now wait a minute. In any given circumstance... Got to be careful now. In any given circumstance, why would you need proof? I said in any, any given circumstance, why would you need proof?
Say what? When there's doubt. When there's doubt. All right, let me, let me help you. Evidence or proof tells you that something exists that you don't presently have. Because if you had it, you wouldn't need any proof of it because you'd have it. Therefore, proof or evidence takes the place of what it's the proof or evidence of until the thing arrives on the scene. Once the thing arrives on the scene, then you don't need any more proof or evidence because now you have the thing. So therefore, evidence or proof takes the place of. You got that? Okay, watch this now. I got to take it step by step. All right, watch this now. Now, faith is the evidence of things not seen. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you see the word S-E-E-N, seen? What do you think? I know, wait, don't tell me. Don't tell me. I know exactly what you think about. When you see the word seen, first thing you think of is the big toe on your right foot. Right? Is that right? Yeah. That's what you think. You think of the big toe. Oh, I got it. Big toe on your left foot. Is that the first thing is when you see the word seen? What do you think of? Think of eyes. Meaning then, visual perception. Can you agree with that? So, when we say that faith is the evidence of things not seen, we think that faith is the evidence of things not visibly perceived. But I want to suggest to you that that's not what it means. I, I, I mean it, 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 you know, God forbid I tell you what the Bible means. But what I mean is, it, it, it means that, but it means more than that, and we don't want to limit it. Because seen, seen connotes eyes, and eyes connote sensory perceptors that are located in your physical body that feed information to your central nervous system in your brain by visual perception. But if you limited it to eyes, then you miss everything you could hear, everything you could smell, everything you could taste, and everything you could touch. Because you're able to contact the environment around you with more than just your eyes. So let me suggest to you that instead of saying, seen, can we say, perceived by the senses. Now that covers everything. Smell, taste, hear, touch, etc. So we can read it like this then. So faith is the evidence or proof of things not perceived by the senses. Oh, uh oh, 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 pick up on this now. If faith is the evidence or proof of things oh, not perceived by the senses, then that must mean that there are some things that exist outside the realm of the senses and can only be contacted with your faith. Ha! Hallelujah! <laughs> Absolutely. You get that? Because what? It is impossible to have evidence for something that doesn't exist. So if God says that faith is the evidence of things not perceived by the senses, that means there must be some things that are outside the realm of the senses that can only be contacted by your faith. Amen. Now, now, how do I know what's out there in that, that realm outside the realm of the senses? What is that realm? It's the spirit world. It's the world in which God, our Father, dwells. And God is a spirit, and he dwells in the spirit world. And the spirit world is more real than the physical three-dimensional world. Because the three-dimensional world came out of the spirit world, so the spirit world had to pre-exist the physical three-dimensional world. Therefore, the three-dimensional physical world is not the real world. The spirit world is the real world, and this is only a reflection of the real world. See, God is a spirit. God lives in the spirit world. And the spirit world is everywhere. The spirit world is everywhere. It's everywhere. All around us. In fact, watch this. Watch this closely now. Watch this closely. I just passed my hand through the spirit world. Now see, you thought I said that to be funny. It's silly. No, I did. See, you have to understand that there are different realms. And just because you can't perceive them with your senses doesn't mean that they don't exist. Right now, while we're sitting in this building, there are AM radio waves going through the building right now. There are FM, FM1, FM2 radio waves going through the building. There are short wave, long wave, medium wave. 
there's radar, there are satellites that are stationed 22,500 miles above the Earth that you can't even see with your eye that have a footprint down here that is beaming down signals from the satellite. Direct TV, all kinds of things. We don't hear anything. I don't hear any radio broadcasts right now. I don't see anything. You can't say it doesn't exist because you can't see it. You have enough sense to know that in order to contact that realm, you have to have a device. Amen. <laughs> Got to have a method. Got to have a receiver. And the receiver, AM, is an AM. You cannot pick up AM on an FM receiver. You can't pick up UHF on a VHF receiver. You've got to have a receiver that's all calibrated to the same level of the transmission. God transmits on the transmission frequency of F-A-I-T-H. And if you don't have your receiver tuned in, guess what you're going to pick up? Zilch, nothing. Now, wait a minute. If there are some things that exist out there in that spirit realm where God is, how do I know what's out there? How am I going to know what I can contact with my faith? And since God set up the system, he, he, he's got to give me he, he's got to give me some way to know what's out there. I mean, if I want to watch TV tonight, after the service, we go home and I want to watch TV. Right now, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I don't know what's being broadcast. You know what I mean? On what channels? Well, I wouldn't. I don't have to pray about it. Oh, Lord, tell me what's happening. What, what, what's on? What, what, what channel? What, what? No, I just go get a TV guide. <laughs> TV guide, look up Wednesday, the date. Look at my watch, see what time it is, check out that, and I, it tell me right away what's playing. Here's your TV guide. Here's your radio log right here. It tells you everything that's playing. Think I'm gonna, think you want to have me some healing mode. Dial up 1 Peter 2.24. What does it say? Oh, with Jesus strapped, I was healed. Think I have a little healing tonight. I receive it in Jesus' name. Well, I tell you what, I think I want to prosper. Well, I go over here to Luke 6.38. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking again, running over. Think I have me a little running over tonight. So I'm going to sow some seed. This tells me what's out there in that spirit world. Faith is how you bring it in. If you don't have your faith in operation, you can't bring it in, even though God wants you to have it. He gave you a TV guide, as it were. Gave you a guide, but tell you exactly what's out there, but it's going to take your faith to get it. Amen. You won't get it by hoping and praying. Okay. Everything in the kingdom of God is activated by faith. Amen. Amen. And see, laws, because faith is a law or a principle, they work whether you know they're working or not. And until you understand that the laws work and learn how to cooperate with the law, then you can't take advantage of the law. You can't take advantage of it, even though God wants you to have it. Did you know, <clears throat> now watch this, I'm going to drop something on you now, you didn't know. Most of you didn't know. Outside the Garden of Eden, there was a uh, Bob wire, 12 foot high, Bob wire fence with razor wire on the top of it. Uh, it, it. It surrounded a square area called a tarmac. Parked on the tarmac was a 747-400 Boeing jetliner. Right next to the Boeing jetliner was the Concorde, fastest commercial airplane that had been built. And right next to the Concorde was the SR-17 Blackbird, fastest airplane in the world. At each corner of this squared area with the barbed wire was gun towers. And stationed at the gun tower there was searchlights and there was somebody that manned the towers 24 hours a day with AK-47s to be sure that nobody tampered with the aircraft on the tarmac. I'm just waiting. I'm, I'm, I want that to sink in. Because see, you think I'm being facetious. But a hundred and some years ago, two brothers, one named Orville, another named Wilbur, decided that they could fly. And at a place called Kitty Hawk, they made some little contraption called a biplane. And they did something nobody else had done before successfully. They took to the air. Now, that, that hundred years ago was somewhere around 6,000 years from the Garden of Eden, biblical chronology. But how come nobody flew before Orville and Wilbur? 
what, what suddenly came on the scene that permitted them to fly, to defy the laws of gravitation and take to the sky like a bird? What, 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 what allowed that to happen? Suddenly God decided to let man fly? No, no. It's something called the law of aerodynamics. They found out how to cooperate with the law, but the law was already there because if, if it wasn't there, they couldn't cooperate with it in the first place. So it had to already be there before they decided to fly. Well, that law...